180 years ago, on Wednesday, the 6th of March, 1844, eight Fanti chiefs signed an agreement with the British government of the day known as the Bond of 1844. How significant is that to the history, not just of Ghana, but Africa? Welcome to History Time with me, Kafi Day, and my guest, Yao Anoche Frimpong. If you haven't yet subscribed to this channel, do so right now. Hit the notification bell and you'll be alerted of new content. The Bond of 1844, Mr. Frimpong. Why is this event significant to us as black people? The Bond of 1844 will always be significant. And that means be remembered in the history of this country. And for that matter, Africa, because it was on the same day. And I'm told the original bond of 1844 was signed on 6th March, which was a Wednesday. A Wednesday. And it was on a Wednesday that Ghana won its independence after, I think, 113 yes. years mm -hmm. under the British. And the significance was that the bond of 1844 laid the foundation of colonialism in the country. And that was why, very significantly, our independence too had to be given on that day, more than 113 years later. Let's take it back some centuries before the signing of this historic agreement. What was the involvement of the British in affairs on the Gold Coast in the 16th century? Years, hundreds of years before this bond was signed. You see, the <clears throat> British arrived in the country after earlier ones, like the Portuguese, and then the Dutch, and then the Swedes, and the Danes. Then about the 17th century, mm -hmm. they were very firmly here under Captain Thomas Windham. Mm -hmm. Yeah, They stayed here, traded among the people, and discovered that this place was a very suitable place for them, especially positioning themselves in those days at Cape Coast, which was so suitable for them because more or less it enabled them to trade to the west, the, the western states like Ahanta and Wasa, where we had a lot of gold. And then in the interior, there was the Kumasi Cape Coast Road, which passed through Asen and Dentra. And you know that the Dentras and the Intim Jakari were very powerful people who supplied Cape Coast and Elmina with castles, sorry, with slaves and then gold. So positioning themselves there to the western part of the country was very helpful and they never felt they had to leave and they had to stay here and then make sure they had made the best out of the system. So, so the trade in slaves and gold was ongoing, and there was also conflict between the major states, the Fanti and the Asante. You see, the success of the European trade on the Gold Coast gave birth to two preeminent tribes. First was the Fanti, and second, Ashanti. Fanti because they position themselves such that with nothing originating from their land and with nothing in hand to sell, they had become the middlemen between the English people in particular and all other people who traded with the English, especially those from the interior. And they were smart enough to ensure that nobody from the interior, and I mean the Asen, Denchira, and the Ashanti, and the Bono people, Northerners, everybody. Nobody would be allowed to enter the castle because the European goods from the ships would straight away be delivered to the castle. So that became their GNTC, their Kingsway, their USC. So this was like the, the big markets. Big market, Warehouse, wholesale. Wholesale. Everything, that mm -hmm. was where mm -hmm. it was. Mm -hmm. and what, the, what kind of things were coming from Europe? Oh. All European goods, like clothing, mm -hmm. especially, drinks, mm -hmm. mirror, 
and then building materials, you know, anything that today are manufactured in Europe, where the same, you know, and then with the local things, you can imagine that the spices like uh, pepper, you know, and then meat, beef coming from the interior, and especially gold and slaves were what they needed from us. Who was being enslaved and, and brought over to be sold? Our own people, mm -hmm. our own people, all the tribes. You know, you have, you had a boy, very truant, would not listen to you. And those days were days of polygamy. So you have about 10 wives with more than 30 children. And those who would be truant to you, you will sell them off, especially the accounts who belong to the matrilineal system. So your own son or daughter was valueless to you. And then the second people who will be sold, largely, People who had become victims of war, if you are defeated in war, you are vanquished, then the victor state would choose your men, people who would, if there were artisans among them, they would spare them. The royals among them would become slaves and counselors in the victor states. Sometimes they created stools for them because of knowledge, certain type of knowledge they've got. Let me give you a very good example. When the Ashantis fought the German people, the Germans are the same as the uh, Doma people. The Ivory Coast side is called German. Those in Ghana are called Doma. Then the chief they came across, Edinkra, was wearing some cloth which Ashantis had never set eyes on. Very valuable to them. And Ashantis always tried to protect whatever that came to their soil. So that cloth, those who knew how to weave the cloth were brought to Ashanti and they became counselors, very important people because they were technocrats and they didn't change the name Edinkra. That's why still we have Edinkra which cloth. Is, which is the cloth? Among mm -hmm. the Ashantis. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go to Ashanti, we have Angloga, where Ewa people are settled. We have another place called Enzima, a great Enzima, where mm -hmm. Enzimas, uh, the, Enzima, the origins of the Enzimas are settled. Fanti New Town. Fanti New Town for the Fantis. Mm -hmm. Atapame down, those from the Dahomey area who came to teach them how to build modern houses. Mm -hmm. uh, so they tried to preserve whatever they came across. And I'm saying that with this type of trade, these are the things, uh, sorry, uh, with a trade in slavery, some will be used as slaves on the farms for the victor states. Some as major technocrats or artisans. Some will be sacrificed for their gods. Yeah, religious purposes. For religious purposes. For example, if a particular deity will take only twins and they come across twins, they've captured you, definitely you know you'll be sacrificed by a large they will transport all of them to the coast to be sold into slavery so that they will get guns and gunpowder and more money to buy the things they also needed. So the Fantis control, they were the middlemen. Middlemen they did not allow the, those on the interior to get to close enter to the, British. the British, to enter the okay. forts and castles. Mm -hmm. So the Fantis will buy the goods, set up shops. So when you come from Kumasi or Wenchi or uh, whatever, Doma, you enter the fancy shops to buy goods. And after that, they see you off. You know, they wouldn't allow you to enter the castle. So it could well be that this item here, sold by a fancy man for 10 cities in the castle, would be about 5 cities, if not less. Or maybe would be 9 cities, 50 pesos. But who knows whether the fancy man is saying the truth or not. So that also gave birth to another power in the interior that could capture more slaves to sell. And for that matter, getting more guns and more additional weapons so that they would expand, expand, and be able to capture and capture and be able to sell and sell. So it was just like a vicious cycle going on and on and on. on because you capture, you get the guns, you can now get more people and come and, and, and sell, get more guns, go and get more war, more, more people. So it was just going round and so round. So that was why we said that it gave birth to two big states, one in the south controlling the trade and one in the hinterland supply. supplying mm. 
the objects of the state, the trade. At some point in time, did Asante want to cut out the middlemen? Of course. You see, initially, the Ashantis didn't know what was actually happening. All they knew, because they had not visited the coast before, so all they knew was, for the first time in their lives, coming to the Fanti area, buying goods and going away. You know, and when you are in Kumasi or Fenso or Mampong, you see European goods, you are excited until the 1806 issue. This Kojotibu and Koku Apotai, two Asan chiefs, you know, that had offended the Asantehine Osebos, that made him to come to the south. What was the offense? What did they do? The offense was that uh, Asin was ruled by two states, Asin Atandansu and then Asin uh, Apimenim. And then Apimenim was ruled by Kojo uh, at Amuade. One of his top chiefs died. He was buried with plenty gold. And somebody from Kojo Tibu and then Koku Aputai's place saw it and in the night desecrated the grave. In search of the gold. In search of the gold. That's until he had it and he invited them to settle the matter. Definitely, he will ask Kojo Tibu and Koku Aputai to go and pay back and that will be the end. They went, they didn't pay. That's until he sent messengers there and they chopped off their heads. So Ashanti will come in. When Ashanti came in, they ran from Asin. Take it back a bit. The one who was buried in gold, where was he from? From Amuadai's place. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. He so, was not an Asante. No, Asin was. He was the, an the, man. Yeah, so, the so, what, what was Asante Hini's interest in this case? Because Asin was a tributary of Ashanti. Okay, so allied to Ashanti. Yes, yeah, so, so they, they had to come in to settle the subs, matter. Uh, yeah, help their yeah. own. Well, Asante Hini got angry that you have killed my own messengers. Mm -hmm. I have to come in directly. Mm -hmm. And Ashanti have a saying that. So this year, if the royal doesn't fight, the slave would abscond. Mm. So most of the awards, the Asante Hini himself would lead. Like the way I say to two led one of the wars, and we know what happened. So to leadership him. by example. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the man came down. He came first, he defeated, rooted them in Asin. And from Asin, he heard that Kojotibu and Aputai had run to a town called Abra where the Fanti Confederation was holding a meeting. At that time, there had never been a direct confrontation between an Asin and Fanti. And because the Fantis were living closer to the whites, and they felt the Ashantis were Bushmen and very savage, so they thought they could fight the Ashantis. So they decided to not to own up the two men, but rather to protect them, and decided to fight them. And you know Ashanti would overwhelm them. That was what brought Ashanti to the coast for the first time. And the Fanti mistake, that made them come to the coast the first time. Now they came to see that, oh, these goods were buying from Fanti shops, Fanti villages everywhere, not knowing the goods are being sold by the white people mm. themselves. And they are those who eventually buy our gold and slaves. So why don't we eliminate the weak Fantis? The middlemen. The middlemen, go they have been beaten. Mm -hmm. They go straight to these people, the wholesalers, the wholesalers. <laughs> and that was what eventually would lead to incessant raids on the coast by the, by the Ashanti Francis. people, oh, okay. all because they wanted to deal directly with those who would take their slaves and gold outside the country and nobody else. So it was a business decision, really? Business decision. They also felt the Fantis were cheats. And what worried them and annoyed them most was that the Fantis had nothing to sell except to add prices to the goods they had from the shops, yeah. from the white people. Yeah, but that's what middlemen middle do. <laughs> middlemen just buy and then, and then the add. Kwa, the yeah, 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 that's, it's a middleman behavior. So, <laughs> that, so the Ashantis felt that yeah, 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 the, yeah, 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 we are bringing yeah, the gold, we are bringing the slaves. Uh -huh. Let's give it straight to the white man. Very good. Cut out the you don't man. sell it to the mm -hmm. phantom man for the phantom man to sell it to the white man. Just as the white man doesn't have to sell to the phantom man for the phantom man to sell to the Ashanti man. So how did this bring the British into the picture? So later on, the British realizing, whole British parliament realizing that the trade was exceptionally profitable, but for the trouble between the Fante and the Ashanti, so in 1822, they decided to send a governor 
from Sierra Leone to the Gold Coast, such as Makati, to take control of the affairs on the Gold Coast and to ensure that there will be peace on the Gold Coast so that trade could flourish. When he came, the mistake he made was that because the Ashantis, uh, the, front, the white, the English, had never directly confronted the Ashantis before, he didn't have that background. He felt that the Ashantis didn't have weapons, they were very savage people, they didn't know the art of war. So he took a handful of soldiers and decided to carry the fight to the Ashantis. In fact, to their own capital, Kumase, quell them, and that would be the antidote to all the problems we're having on the Gold Coast, big which was a, big very, mistake. T a terrible, terrible, terrible mistake. And so he went on, and we learned that he used the Wasa area, uh, the extreme west. And incidentally, the Ashanti soldiers too, you know, when he had just about 500 soldiers, the Ashantis were coming with more than 20,000 people <laughs> to punish the Wasa and the Dentra people for supporting the Fantas in earlier skirmishes. So you see that it was a very accidental time. That was 40 times the strength of, of the army that they had. They, 500 they had. versus 20,000 is yeah. seriously overwhelmed. And so the Ashantis heard that this man was coming, you know, to fight them. Oh, they would also push on and... Uh, at a very fa a battle, I won't call it a famous battle, no, because it was the coastal people who were actually killed at a village called Adamanso, near another bigger village called Bonsaso, along the river Bonsa, Bonsa. that flows into the Ancobra. You know, the battle was fought and later acquired the reputation as Nsamanko. Mm. And we have already explained that. It was the Wasa people who, in the night, got up and didn't want a big war on their land, didn't want to encounter Ashanti, and so decided that they would kill the coastal troops. And the following morning, when they saw that a large portion of their uh, soldiers had been killed, without hearing gunshot or anything, said, we are Kun Samanku. We are fighting ghosts. And the Dubuahin and FK were doing armchair philosophizing without going to the area to find out whether there's actually a town called Nsamanko. Decided to name it the Battle of Nsamanko. Look at the mm -hmm. catch, mm -hmm. catchy nature of it, the mm -hmm. Battle of Nsamanko. Meaning there's a community or a town cool. or a village called, but in actual fact, it was fought at Adamansu, near Bonsasu, mm -hmm. and no town or village or community in the western region at all in the was area called um, uh, in some Manco. Is Bonsasu near the, the, the town where you have the Bonsa Tires Company? No. That, uh, this Bonsasu is at the upper, okay. yeah, the upper riparian version right. of the river. Okay. And Bonsasu near between Takwa and Nusaim. So were the, were the Wasa, just the Wasa people were allies of the Ashantis? They were not, uh, they were supposed to be allies, allies of, of the, the Ashantis. Ashantis. Who had gone in to help the Fantis? So the Wasas were only the Ashantis were coming in to punish them mm. because not just ordinary allies, mm -hmm. they were tributary state. Okay. So they were coming to punish them. All right. And incidentally, Makati was going to fight Ashanti. Uh, and he left a bigger army of two thousand somewhere and decided to penetrate the forest with, with five hundred. And so even if he had gone with 10,000 Ashanti would have defeated. In fact, entering that Ashanti forest, yeah. I mean, even if they had gone with 50,000, they would have been defeated. But they also had guns as well. Serious guns. They yeah. didn't know that the Ashantis were getting guns from the Dutch people in Elmina. Mm. Yes, the Fantis controlled the business very well. They sold everything to the Ashantis, less weapons. Mm. They wouldn't sell ammunition mm. to the Fanti, uh, Shanti because they knew what would happen so, to them. So the British trade that the Fantis were having, they didn't sell weapons from the British to the Ashantis? They, sold, they bought weapons for, for themselves. themselves, but not to be given to of the Of course, you don't, you don't arm your enemy. You arm yeah, your yeah, enemy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the Ashantis were getting it from their allies, the Dutch. Was it a direct trade with the Dutch? The direct trade with the okay, Dutch. so there was no middleman issue there no, with the Dutch? No, no middleman. So this because was Almina. 
Elmina, okay. and the people of Elmina, that's why the Fantis call them the Elmina, the conquensis. Mm. Elmina conquensis for like, like the gossips. The gossip, betrayers. Okay. Okay. Because they were allies, the Fantis were allies of the Ashantis. Okay. And they were separate and distinct from the Cape Coasters. Mm. So Ashantis were getting supplies from there. But they also felt that because uh, English goods were juicy and superior, and everybody wanted that, that was why they wanted a direct dealing with Cape Coast. Mm -hmm. That's the English. Indeed. So it means getting the English and then the Dutch would have put the Ashantis on a higher pedestal. How did all of these events, these uh, inter... Uh, I wouldn't call them tribes. These are two states, the Fantis and the Asante states, all that fighting. How did that all lead to the bond of 1844? It will lead to the bond of 1844 because when 1824, Ashanti were able to defeat such as Makati, mm -hmm. the British government regretted its action of sending Makati to the Gold Coast and immediately left the trade and recalled all its citizens back to England. Mm. Nobody should trade there because we cannot protect you. At least for the first time, we've seen that Ashanti is a power to deal with and we are not prepared to deal with Ashanti power. So everybody should go back. And that was to, in fact, freeze all British activities on the Gold Coast. But the traders themselves knew how profitable the trade was and then knew how important Ashanti was to the trade. So they felt that the solution to the problem on the Gold Coast was not war, and two, was not recalling your citizens, but find a way of mediating between Ashanti and Fante. Mm. And once there is peace between Ashanti and Fante, trade would flourish. You should know what Ashantis want, and you should also know what the Fantes want. And once you give them, there will be peace. So the But wasn't it going to be an impossible situation? Because the Asantes wanted direct access to the British. And the Fantes didn't want to give them that direct access. It worked for them. They brought in a man they found in England who was very suitable for the job. Who was that? Captain McLean. Captain George McLean. He came in in 1830 and immediately signed a treaty with the Fante people to protect them, to ensure that the, uh, the, 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 the British people would govern them and supply them whatever they needed. And the Fantes, who always wanted trade to flourish, because that was the only weapon they had, nothing more. So they accepted. And then he realized that if you do it one-sided, you will not succeed. So he signed a peace treaty with the Ashanti People. McLean. McLean signed a peace treaty in mm -hmm. the following year, 1831, with the Ashantis. And immediately there was peace. The Ashantis knew where they ended. And the Fantis also knew where they would also end. And what would please or displease the uh, Ashanti people. So there was peace. And once there was peace, the Association of British traded traders started having heavy profits, making heavy profits and transporting the profits back home. The British government would get to know it, that our people are making heavy profits. And once you make profit, you know you would import more goods to the Gold Coast. And by importing more goods, the meaning is that you are buying more goods from the metropolitan country, mm -hmm. England. So good business. Good business. You are buying. And once you are buying more goods, it means producers back home in the United Kingdom. Good business. Well, very good. Mm -hmm. So with that, the British government now comes in again. That look, uh, Captain George McLean, you've done very well, you and your traders. We believe that. As you have taken over the administration of the Gold Coast and everything is going well with you, we have to formalize it mm. so that the government back home can take responsibility of the trade and give you better protection. So now they bring in a second governor, Commander Hill, to the Gold Coast. So you understand. So Commander Hill is now a real governor appointed by the British government. 
that uh, Captain George McLean was just a governor appointed by the, the traders. traders. So when he came, uh, Commander Hill came in, uh, McLean, who was more experienced, you know, was rather reduced in title and position. Hill became the British governor, the second governor after, the second British governor, government's governor after uh, Sir Charles McCarthy. And then uh, McLean was given the position of judicial assessor. Today we'll call it the chief justice. Mm -hmm. So he occupied that position. And the British flourished. Things went on well, very, very smooth. And then the British government also realized that the Gold Coast had started producing a lot of scholars because of the missionary activities and because of the fact that they needed interpreters and then secretaries, security men who would be able to, they should be able to speak your language. They needed people. So they gave basic education to the locals. And with this basic education, the missionaries too would have to augment your education so that you go and be able to read the Bible in English and other languages and transmit to your people. And such person should be given very good education. So around that time, the British now began having problems with the chiefs because the chiefs also had their letter writers, their interpreters, and town secretaries, you know, very well educated, who could challenge the whites face to face. And even above all, we had one advantage they didn't have. The English trading here didn't know the Dutch language. Mm. But the local people, because they mingled with all the whites, the knew the Dutch language as well as the English, together with the local terrain. And so the English had an idea that whatever relationship we have with the chiefs must now be documented. Formalized. Formalized. So that when they ask you why you think this chief must take instructions from you, you can give a reason. So originally, about eight chiefs mm -hmm. met. You know, we had Kojo Tibu from Denchra, yes. uh, Otu from Abra, and then we have uh, Joe Gatte. Mm -hmm. uh, Nana, jo, no, jo, not Gatte. Joe Agre oh. from Cape Coast, yes. Ewusi from Dominase, mm -hmm. and then Nana Monu from uh, this place, Anumabu. Anumabu. Mm -hmm. And then one Tibu from Denchira, and then Jebi from Asen, and then Ankara from Domadie, and then uh, uh, another Tibu from the Asen Kuma. area. Yeah, Tibu Kuma. Tibu Kuma from yeah, Asen. So eight chiefs. Eight yeah, chiefs mm -hmm. originally mm -hmm. who signed the bond of 1844. And that was not the end. As soon as the bond was signed, they sent it to all the chiefs along the coast to endorse it and become members. So eventually from eight, it went to a number, almost 60. A hunter came in, Wasa, all the areas, with the exception of Nzimaland, where their chief then, called Kwekwaka, or Kwekwaka, refused to sign. Why? He said that when they write down, they read it to him, and we have to know what was in it, the content. Mm -hmm. The content was respect for human rights and human dignity and human property. Then the second one was that they should stop trading in slaves and pioneering. I'm sure you know, Paren, mm -hmm. the situation whereby when you owe someone and you are not able to pay, the, one, the lender mm -hmm. is able to seize your relative, make him work on the farm for every 10 years or beyond until the money has been repaid. Mm -hmm. We call that pioneering. Mm -hmm. And then the third one was that they should accept Brit the British judicial system in uh, major offenses like murder. And it was good they introduced that because whenever you committed murder, the chiefs will summarily execute you. Take your head off. Yes. And the British felt that it was wrong. And when also a chief died in those days, they would sacrifice certain people. So the British felt anything to do with human life should be reserved for them. Is it an irony that people who were dealing in human beings were, drew up an agreement to stop uh, other human beings from, 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 from 
executing and killing other people. Okay. That's a big irony. That's an irony, but incidentally, mm -hmm. around that time, slavery had ended, and our people were still doing it with the Dutch. Mm -hmm. So that the English stepped in mm -hmm. that they have to ensure that slavery has ended and it has ended completely. That's why they introduced that part. So this and then bond, finally, yeah, go ahead. the fourth one mm -hmm. was uh, to accept the British administration. Mm -hmm. uh, any, anyone who would sign, you accept. So when this was sent to all the chiefs, listen very carefully, when it was sent to all the chiefs to sign, they felt that because it was being brought by the British, the meaning was that we are going to get a new form of defense oh. against our Ashanti enemies. So the African chiefs who signed this document thought they were getting into a military it was defense, a de defense agreement. A agreement that like, whenever like, there like is... NATO. Yes, like whenever <laughs> there is war, mm -hmm. we we'll supply we'll men. Yeah. They have superior weapons. Mm -hmm. They will give us. Mm -hmm. So it was a form of protection for them. Okay. And they disregarded the other part which says you come under British administration and they didn't bother, you know, with and after now, you know, Ghani Africans do that. Whenever many, many managers and directors, when there is a document for them to sign, when they pick it, they first they only ask, Where am I supposed to sign, to sign without reading it? Yes. <laughs> and then our women who go for bank loans, you know they do the same thing. Mm. Where can I sign? Where can I That's sign? Where can I put my thumbprint? Because he sees money there. It's the money he's interested in. The magnet. Not all the rest. Conditions. And after signing, you see conditions upon conditions, which hitherto you did, you did not, not know. know. But then it's too late. So that was the problem. Yeah. So, so they, the British felt that it was the formalization of the administration on the Gold Coast. Mm. And our people also felt that it was just a military yeah. pact. B b build, built by two partners. So two they equal, case there's a war, then they, we can call on them. Call them. So two, two war uh, distant. Equal partners. Why didn't the African chiefs get clarification? Because they were not interested. All that they were interested protection. in was the protection. Okay, so. And I believe that, you see, white people, there are certain things they won't put on paper. When they come for you to start, they will tell you, we'll give you goods, we'll give you weapons, we'll give you this against the Ashanti people. And when this was made clear, to King Kekwaka of Nzimaland, having read everything. First of all, he said that the Fantis are not my brothers. All the people you have listed here, I don't have any friendship or any alliance with them. And then the old English people too. You see, the story is that the English have a fort, Fort Apollonia, at the Nzima capital called Beim. And whenever the chief beat his gongo, the English would counter him. So he got angry and then moved the capital from Berlin to Atuambo. So when the same English people came in with the treaty, the bond, for him to sign, definitely you know that he will not respect it. And then two, Fantis were not his friends. His friends are the Ashantis. We learn from elsewhere that anytime Ashantis were not getting goods, at Elmina to buy. They will have to trek to the Nzema area to buy because they were their friends. And it was a very long journey. And the Nzemas would sell at uh, lower prices, unlike the Fantis. So they, were, they knew only the Ashanti people. And that's why they called them Ashanti Kotoko and reversely Nzema Kotoko. So why today I'm signing an agreement with the white people with the backing of the Fantis? What would the Ashanti say when exactly. they hear that this is what I have done? Mm -hmm. So he was the only one who, who did, did not, not sign. sign the bond of 1844. Did it affect him in any Seriously, way? Seriously. They went away, organized a very big army, the bond army. And they noted that you said army. Rushed upon him and they were able to lure some of his own counselors. And so instead of Enzema land fighting the British army, they rather picked their own chief as a prisoner and sent him to the British. And then he was arrested. And for what they had done, they split Nzema land into two, Eastern Nzema, Western Nzema. You know, today we have Jomoro, that's Western, and then Elembele, Eastern Nzema, for those who betrayed King Keku Aka. 
So that was what happened to me. And that was also for you to know that the people had really come for real business and they did not want anything to stand in their way. And then after the bond of 1844, they were also able to sign a bond with the Ashantis. Not a real new bond, but they always expected Ashanti to respect the 1831 bond or treaty signed with MacLean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was what happened. That was the bond of 1844. So would, you, would, it, would I be right in saying that the signing of this bond of 1844 in effect formalized colonialism in Ghana? In, in Gold Coast? On the in Gold Coast. Ghana. I would say yes, because of the impact of the bond. Because of the impact of the bond. <clears throat> the first impact, which we have already known is the fact that it had formalized their system of administration. The second impact was that it had enabled the people to accept the British system of uh, judicial, uh, the British judicial system. So would you say that that was the beginning of, of your profession? In, uh, that, that was lawyers it. and judges in, in, in Gold Coast? Yes. It started from there? It started from there. Mm. And also it enabled a big chunk of customary law to enter the British system of mm. judicial administration. Mm. A very classic example is Samanso. I'm sure you know Samanso. Educate me. Or oral, the oral form of making mm. a will. Mm. 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 Okay. You know, yeah. we were not documenting yeah. ours. And the British accepted that any time somebody was embarking on a long journey mm -hmm. or war or uh, dangerously mm -hmm. ill. Mm -hmm. eh? So that's the, the, the background. Yes. Two, you call credible witnesses. And then three, you have in mind the beneficiary of whatever you are going to give up. Oh, okay. And then the property being yourself acquired property. Then you could assign everything to the beneficiary, provided you don't recover. Mm. And when you give everything to that, when I die, a should go to Mr. X, B should go to Y, those things. If you recover, then, then, then there's no it's way. Quiet. And if you don't recover, then it, it, it's, it's acceptable. And when the mm -hmm. matter goes to court, they will only call upon witness. those witnesses. Okay. And then another thing too, having given you those things, you must have, you must have done what you call acknowledgement, asida. So within a short time, this thing has spread to Accra, has spread to voter region everywhere, and it was acceptable. And then any time there was a piece of custom, like the custom of secession among all the people of the Gold Coast, whether Ga, Ewe, or the Fanti or Shanti, whatever, there's one thing that runs through all of them, that a dying person cannot choose his own successor. Your successor would be chosen by your head of family on the advice of the counselors or principal members of the family. This is a piece of customary law that entered the British system of law. So that rule still specific? That, yes. Unless you are royal, because a royal... We, the royals, you, you cannot choose somebody who will succeed you. Please, the Mahine cannot do that. Can't. Awo Mephia cannot do that. Togo Afede cannot do that. Santehine cannot do that. You die and go. And go. <laughs> the king makers would choose somebody okay. who will succeed you. And then it's also, not like the British system where when the king dies, we know that his daughter is his first because, child. Because, yes, for mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. the first child, life. even if he's insane, the first child goes. he will be the king <laughs> unless he decides to abdicate. <laughs> but in our system, everything belongs to the entire family. The family. So they will choose somebody mm. to inherit mm. you. So, so these all are, these things were incorporated into our and the legal pieces system. pieces of customary laws hidden somewhere, mm. provided you can prove it repeatedly mm -hmm. in court, and then it will be accepted as, uh, 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 repeatedly becomes notoriously accepted, okay. as laid down in a case called Ngu versus Atai in 1925. So customary law became part of the British system of judicial administration. And the British, uh, I, I'm assuming that they, they made this happen so that it could facilitate the administration of the, of the colony. It's as simple and, and keep as making that. money for them. For the, keep for, for making the money for them. So once there is peace, and then if there will be peace, it will come from the acceptance of their administration and then the justice system. Because their justice system was one that you know, gave everybody an opportunity to speak out, to be heard. 
you know, in those days, if you had a problem with a royal, definitely you will not succeed. Mm -hmm. yeah, I remember one famous king who was fighting for the Asantehene on the battlefield. When he returned, he heard that, I mean, his wife, something had happened to his wife, and he was not happy. Before he could complain, they had to execute him. They took his head off. Yes. Because how do you go and accuse the Santehene of Messing infidelity? Very good. <laughs> you know, but this is something that can never happen mm. under the British system. And people really loved it. And the more they loved it, the more it went on. Until eventually, in 1872, the Dutch, who were the rivals of the English, left the country. And the moment they left the country, the British felt that they had to take over the whole country and then extend their system of administration throughout the length and breadth of the country. And that led to the Sagranti War, which we have dealt with already. Mm -hmm. And then their system, because they signed a bond with the chiefs, let's learn it very carefully, because they signed a bond with the chiefs. They respected the chiefs because that was the institution they have back home, the monarchical system of government, as opposed to France, that was a republic. So the British continued to give respect to the chiefs and made the chiefs to know that when we are administering the coast, we will need tax, collect taxes from your people. And the taxes we use to set up schools for your children to pay you, you the chiefs, mm -hmm. the work you are doing, we have to pay you. So when the chiefs realized that it was very easy to collect money from their people, the people would not pay the money if it was being collected by the white people, but if it's coming from their own chiefs, they will pay. They will pay. And secondly, making them know that you have ownership in the schools. We are building our own schools. It was easier for the people to make contributions, also to do what you call communal labor, because the axe was not coming from the white man. It was their own people. But it was still the white man who was controlling everything at the top. Controlling everything, but the people didn't know. Mm. And that's why in history we call it indirect rule system. Rules. So the bond of 1844 actually gave birth to the indirect rule system, because it was linked to the chiefs as men and in fact, as the very uh, the very poles around which everybody, everything revolved. And so by the beginning of the 20th century, would you say Ghana as we know it now, almost, was under British rule? It was under British rule, and it was a very smart move for them because administering the coast did not mean getting money from the metropolis, the metropolitan country, to do. No. You have to raise your own mm. resources. So internally generated internally funds. Internally generated funds. Mm -hmm. And to be able to generate funds, you must be able to tax the people. And to be able to tax the people, you must expand in the colonial war. And that was why they expanded to Ashanti. Mm -hmm. eh? You know it, that yeah. in February, March, mm -hmm. 1874. And to Volta, mm -hmm. it was June. And getting Ashanti means automatically getting Northern the Northern... Territories people and that means getting a lot of money to pay their staff getting more money to import more goods selling the goods and now getting a wider market and that was the reason why we believe that our independence that we won in 1957 was nothing more than actually bringing an end to the bond of 1844 what do you think would have happened if the chiefs Tibu, Otu, Kuma, JB, Ankara, Ewusi, Amonu, and Agri, if they hadn't signed this bond. What would have happened is that happen? British wouldn't have been strong enough, mm -hmm. for example, to go and fight Kekwaka. So that would have been the end of their administration, the end of British administration on the coast. Mm -hmm. But that wouldn't have given an end to trade because the people wanted the trade, they needed the trade. And the Fantis, the Ashantis were fighting the, uh, the Ashantis were fighting the Fantis, not because of anything, because of trade. So it means that everybody wanted trade, ultimately. But I believe if they had not signed it, eventually it would have 
been easier for the French to penetrate. Mm. Because the French were able to take some of the Ashanti tributaries after the 1874 Sagranti War, like the Baule people, like the Anin people, and then the German people, the Bontuku and the Jula. They took them away and they were coming in. They were coming. And we needed somebody like George Ekem Ferguson, who was a master of languages and a great mediator to talk to the people of Brekum. Brekum wanted to succeed and join uh, the French. A large portion of the Bono area, they wanted to join the French. And Ekem Ferguson was sent there to sign treaties with them so that they would stay. He went to the north. And he signed treaties with the northern people, and they decided to stay with us until uh, he was killed by this, the slave raiders, Samorian Babatu. So I'm saying that if the Fantas had not signed it, they would have been lured into the hands of the, uh, the, the, French. the French. Otherwise, Fantaland would have become a Dutch territory, because the Dutch did not leave until 1872. So whatever that happened, I believe that even in Europe, Holland is a very small country, like one region in Ghana, and it hasn't got respect in world affairs. And France too. France was defeated. First World War, the first country to be defeated by Germany. Second World War, the first country to be defeated by Germany. So I don't think Ghana would have been proud associating itself with the French. It's good we are with the British people, no matter how bad they might be. And it is still better because, owing to the indirect rule system, they trained our people to be able to man themselves. And at a certain time, they left. In the case of France, they came with assimilation. Assimilation policy, direct rule. They destroyed African institutions, whereas the British augmented and promoted African institutions through the chiefs, so that the people would forever not know that they were behind them, they were colonizing them. So we were just lucky. If the French had come in, they would have disunified. They would have fought till crashing Ashanti to take the golden stool away. If you will not agree, then you desecrate Ashanti entirely. That was what they did to our brothers west of our sides. And today, they don't have any strong institution. And from class one to the day that you die, you have to speak the French language you know, at all levels. And they don't have a bank for Ivory Coast or any French-speaking country, your central bank. They have banks, sorry, but you don't have a central bank. You don't have your own currency. The currency is a French currency printed in France, giving France billions of dollars at the end of every year. And black people are even able to sit in French parliament, something to lure them. So, and then you go to Ivory Coast, the recent African Cup, all the stadiums or stadia built by a French company, and forever and ever it will owned by the French government. After all, the assembly in Ivory Coast is owned by the French government. We are thankful to God that we are colonized by the English people. We don't have any problem with the English. If we are fighting, they won't come in to help us. If they are also fighting, we won't go there. In the case of France, up till now, who will even become the president of Ivory Coast will have to be endorsed by the French. And during their civil war, you know, it was the French who came in directly and were able to capture uh, the former president, you understand, Babo. Mm -hmm. Something that Britain would never, and the word is never, do to any of their former colonies. And thank God, we use a language that rules the whole world, a language spoken by Britain, by Canada, by America, by Australia, by New Zealand, by South Africa by Uganda, by Nigeria, by Ghana. Was the bond of 84, 1844 good for, for Ghana? That is what I mean. It no was? matter, because, you see, later on you will know that it's from 1844, mm -hmm. there, it, there, there will come a time when all the European powers would assemble at Berlin. 1884. 1884, mm -hmm. to partition Africa among themselves. And we were lucky that before they could step here, the British had already mm -hmm. taken hold of the whole country. After all, 1874 came 10 long years before 1884. So I would say that no matter the evils of colonialism, British colonialism was far better and less evil. So we have to accept it because no matter what, we would have been 
colonized by one European power or the other. Imagine Ghana having been colonized by a tiny country such as Belgium or a poor country such as Portugal or Spain, you know, or a weak country like France, mm -hmm. to also to come and impose direct rule mm -hmm. here. Please, Britain is okay. Uh, after all, even America was colonized by, by Britain. Britain. And India, colonized by, by Britain. Britain. So who's so rude? Who will not be a Roman? It's good we associate ourselves with those people. Was it a deliberate policy by Kwame Nkrumah to tie our independence to the 6th March? Because 6th March, Independence Day, has a direct link, uh, almost a link with the 6th March, um, 1844, where the bond of, when the bond was signed in Formina. It was, yes, it was deliberate mm. between the British government and Kwame Nkrumah. And it's good you ask this question. J.B. Dankwa supported the idea that if we were to have independence in future, it should fall on the 6th of March. He himself, he even supported the idea, even though he didn't agree with Nkrumah on so many things. Mm. He felt that one day if you should get independence, that independence should fall on a six match because you know that he was an anthropologist, a historian, and then a, 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 a Pan-Africanist, and Nkrumah too, economist, a historian, a sociologist, okay. sociologist related to anthropology, mm. uh -huh. and then a Pan-Africanist, and who also felt that the British had cheated us through and through. And so there must always be something for us to remember that we have thrown away what they did formally. So the first formal thing that was done was 6 March 1844, bringing us under them. And then the second formal thing will be the 6 March 1957, where we will write that no more British administration here, scaling down the British, the Union Jack, and then uplifting the Black Star. And finally, for a young teenager or a Gen Z, Looking at these uh, events that took place 180 years ago, as we celebrate our independence this year, looking back at the bond of 1844, what should they learn from it? What they should learn from it was that, whereas the coastal chiefs, you know, accepted the British in a very formal way, because they had lived with them since the 16th century, and if you are to talk about uh, European life here, since the 15th century, so they knew them and were able to sign an agreement with them in the comfort of their chairs or their stools. In the Ashanti system, it was different. They did not understand why somebody should rule you. You come under somebody's administration and then you wholeheartedly heartedly do it just by the stroke of the pen. The Ashantis felt they would not do it, and that should come by the boom of the gun. So coming under the British was through two ways, all underpinned by the bond of uh, 1844. The first one was a formal one through writing. The others who would not sign, like uh, Kekwaka, would be captured and destroyed. And that was what happened to all the pocket states that would not sign. They forced them to come in. And then the interior states such as Ashanti, so formidable, the British government will raise a superior army drawn from the Caribbean, from southern Nigeria, Lagos, Hausa land, northern Nigeria, Sierra Leone, the Gambia, then the Achim people, and that means all the bond of 1844 signatories to go and fight their brothers, Ashanti, so, subdue, them. subdue them and bring them under their authority. So this is what young people should know, how we came under the British in one way, through war, in, that's the Ashanti one, and then the earlier one, just by diplomacy. And that they should know that we are in one country, and during the uh, uh, independence struggle, those who fought for it were people from the south, we have so many names. Nkrumah was from the south, Dankwa from the south, Bedema from the south, and they named them plenty. And then Obechebilamte and all others go to the interior, the Ashanti people, 
uh, those days we had Buzia, we had uh, the Jantua brothers, Bafua, Koto, all of them. Then in the north, we had uh, Tombo, and then uh, all those. I mean, Mahama's father was one of them. Baumia's father, uh, Alaji Imoru, Igala, a lot of people. So it means that if coming under the British took diverse ways, fighting against them for independence, at least involved the whole nation at a go. Thank you so much. And happy Independence Day to you. Thank you, this my This year brother. we are 67. Thank you, my brother. Growing, growing. Very, very welcome. And that's the story of uh, the bond of 1844, signed by those eight chiefs 180 years ago to this year. What did you learn from it? And what can, are you taking along with you for the future? Put your comments down below. Let's continue the conversations. It's history time uh, with me, Kafi Day, and my guest, Yao Anache Frimpong. Till we meet in the next video, take care of yourself. <laughs>